The Rosie Ruiz cheating scandal was a major event that drew attention to women's marathoning. But who was Rosie Ruiz, and how was it possible to cheat in a world-class event such as the Boston Marathon? That is what we will be discussing today on Footnoting History. Hello, and welcome to Footnoting History. My name is Esther. Rosie Ruiz cheated. There is no doubt about that. She cheated her way to a respectable finish at the 1979 New York City Marathon, which allowed her to qualify for the Boston Marathon in 1980, in which she stumbled into the winner's circle, probably by accident. Rosie, to this day, denies that she cheated, that she won the Boston Marathon fair and square, that her qualifying time in New York was legitimate, but really the evidence and the whole of reality are against her on this. Today on the show, I'm going to talk about this first major cheating scandal in long distance running. And I'm going to try to lay out the details about what happened, who was Rosie Ruiz, and the aftermath of the scandal. On top of all of that, I want to talk about how this scandal shows that competitive long distance running, especially the marathon competition, by the early 1980s had become a premier sport in the United States. Many observers and fans of the sport have pointed to the Rosie Ruiz incident as being an infamous dark mark in the history of the marathon. But I think instead we should appreciate how the Rosie Ruiz scandal put marathon running on the map, especially women's marathon running. In a way, it is the people who are passionate enough to cheat as much as those who are passionate to train and win, like a Lance Armstrong and the sport of cycling, that really indicate the enormous growth in popularity of an emerging sport. Rosie Ruiz's cheating scandal at its very core was a very strange affair that would be impossible to replicate today by any would-be marathon cheaters. I would also argue that its significance to the history of running is not just what it tells us about the very personal motivations for cheating, but also about the integration of certain technologies with the sport of running that we may take for granted today. So to start off, who was Rosie Ruiz? Well, Rosie at the time was a 26-year-old administrative assistant at Metal Trading Incorporated, a company with offices in Manhattan. She was born in Cuba, but raised in the United States. And she had this kind of pixie haircut and she spoke with a slight accent. And while she was on the slim side, she was a thin woman, she did not have the sinewy and light muscular build of a professional long distance runner. In fact, when Bill Rogers, the marathon legend who won the men's competition for his fourth consecutive time that year at Boston, was asked about his thoughts on Rosie's win, Bill Rogers mentioned that he found it very hard to believe that an amateur like Rosie could have won since her thighs were actually too flabby for someone who could run a marathon in two and a half hours. Rosie claimed that it was her short haircut that made race officials overlook her and perhaps mistook her for a man and why she was able to run the race relatively unnoticed. But I'm getting ahead of myself here. Let's start from the very beginning in New York. The New York City Marathon, along with the Boston Marathon, was beginning in the late 70s and early 1980s to become a major event for marathoners. Right now, you can find marathons being put on virtually every weekend in the United States. But in the late 1970s, the popularity of putting on marathons, let alone those who would be interested in running this event, was just beginning to take off. Little seems to be known about Rosie's life before the scandal, but what we do know is that Boston was not her first time cheating at a marathon. In 1979, she filled out an application to run the New York City Marathon. And on this application, she put down her estimated completion time at four hours and 10 minutes respectable, but in no way near the time uh, that a big league professional runner would have completed a marathon. Yet somehow, she ended up finishing the race in two hours and 56 minutes, the 11th woman overall. So what happened in New York? Did Rosie vastly overestimate how long she would get to the finish line? Not exactly. After the eventual scandal in Boston, a witness to Rosie's cheating in the New York Marathon came forward. Her name was Susan Morrow, and she had taken the subway to Columbus Circle, the closest stop to the marathon finish line in Central Park, so that she could cheer on one of her friends. She got on the West 4th Street subway stop in Greenwich Village, 
And when she got on the train, she saw a woman in running clothes sitting on the train and she had this open seat right next to her. Susan Morrow sat next to her and struck up a conversation, during which the woman introduced herself as Rosie Ruiz and claimed to have hurt her ankle at the 10-mile mark of the race. Rosie, much to Miss Morrow's surprise, got off on the same stop and leaned on her as if she was severely injured to get to the medical tent near the finish line, which we're presuming she slipped across to receive a certificate of completion at an official time of 2.56.33. But Morrow did not know to come forward, and she probably didn't even think to do so until she saw Rosie being crowned with a wreath of laurels as the woman's winner of the Boston Marathon nearly six months later. As for Boston, Rosie's New York Marathon time was good enough to qualify for uh, that marathon and to wear the race number W50, which meant she was the 50th ranked woman overall once she began the Boston Marathon. We know from various people reporting from the sidelines that Rosie frantically shot out from the crowd wearing this thick t-shirt and running shorts at the 25 mile marker and sprinted to the finish line. As soon as she crossed the finish line, seemingly exhausted, but nary a drop of sweat on her back or arms, a few race officials held her up and immediately proclaimed her the winner of the Boston Marathon. Her time of 2.31.56 was one of the fastest times for a woman in the history of the marathon. The real winner of the woman's race, Jacqueline Garot, a Canadian runner from Quebec, came in at 2.34.28. And Garot was surprised that she had come in second because she had passed all of the other elite women in the race around the 18-mile marker and had not seen Rosie. Rosie intended to cheat at the Boston Marathon, but now it is believed that she never intended to cheat and win the women's division. She was merely trying to pull the same scan she did in New York, but miscalculated the time when she should have jumped in towards the end. Immediately following her apparent victory, officials began to investigate the results of the race, and they took about a week to declare Rosie's time as invalid. But why did it take such a long time? Well, this is where we should look, maybe not to the primitive technologies that tracked runners at the time, but more to the actual methods of tracking that did not consider cheating a possibility. Today on the Boston course, there are cameras everywhere, some visible, some not. There are electronic monitors on all of the runners, and there are thousands of volunteers and paid officials who monitor the race course carefully. Back in 1980, there were some people mon monitoring the race, surely, and there were checkpoints and maybe some cameras, but nothing on the scale that we would see today. Rosie's ruse was quickly discovered when two Harvard students, who saw her break from the crowd and sprint towards the finish line, you know, completely sweatless, in that last mile of the course, they came forward with what they witnessed. Fred Lebo, the founder of the New York Roadrunners and the New York City Marathon, voided her results after Susan Morrow came forward as well, which had the result of automatically disqualifying Rosie from her Boston win, as she would therefore never have qualified for that marathon. But Boston officials were adamant about taking their time to investigate what happened. First of all, no one had seen Rosie throughout the race. Second, Rosie's post-race interviews did not help her case any, to say the least. Bill Rogers, again, the winner of the men's division, knew immediately she did not run the race when she confessed not knowing what intervals were. We're here with the women's winner. She's getting a case of the sneezes. Rosie, Rosie Ruiz. Okay. I'm sorry. Rosie Ruiz, the women's winner in the Boston Marathon today with a time of 2.31 and change. Now, we don't know how many seconds that is. It may be a new American record. Um, what, was, what was the time in your first ever marathon, and where was it? It was 2 hours and 56 minutes and 33 seconds in New York last year. And so you improved from 2, two hours and 56 minutes to 2 hours and 31 minutes. What, I what, guess so. <laughs> what do you attribute that improvement in time to? Um, I don't know. Uh, Have you been doing a lot of heavy intervals? Um, someone else asked me that. I'm not sure what intervals are. <laughs> what are they? Well, intervals are, are track workouts that are designed to make your speed improve dramatically. And if you went from a 256 to a 231, one would normally expect that you do a lot of speed work. Is, is someone coaching you or advising you? Uh, no, I advise myself. <laughs> well, it was a fantastic performance, Rosie. Congratulations. 
Rosie Ruiz, the mystery woman winner. We missed her at all our checkpoints. She came through at the finish in a fantastic 2.31. We have to confirm that time at this point, but she was way ahead of the world-class field here today in the Boston Marathon. Thank you, Rosie. Thank you. Of course, any elite runner would not only know what intervals were, but also their splits, which is the time it takes to complete each mile in a race. So why did Rosie do this? There's always a very uh, strong element of vanity and perhaps a need for popular validation when it comes to any act of sports cheating. But Rosie's case has a sort of innocence to it when we compare it to those professional athletes who cheat because millions of dollars or endorsement deals are on the line. The journalist Bill Burt, who wrote an article about Rosie in 2000 for the Eagle Tribune and who attempted to contact her several times for an interview, probably had the best take on what was personally at stake for Rosie. She simply did not want to be embarrassed at work the next day. She likely intended to finish the New York City Marathon in about four hours, but got injured and then decided to take the subway and finish the marathon that way to save face. Her coworkers and her boss, who was a runner himself and incredibly impressed with her spectacular time in New York, urged her to run Boston and even paid for Rosie's entrance fee for the Boston Marathon. At that point, Rosie probably felt an extraordinary amount of pressure to do well in Boston because she did so well in New York. And when she tried to pull the same stunt as she did in New York, it was already too late. So Rosie's fraud wasn't about money and it wasn't really about hogging international glory that wasn't hers to begin with, but really about how the closest people around her would see her as strong, as athletic and determined. The Rosie Ruiz scandal caught many people in the long distance running community by surprise because their first thoughts were, why would anyone want to cheat at a marathon? It was a difficult concept to get their heads around. Marathon running wasn't about coming in at first, wasn't really about winning except for a very elite few, and it definitely wasn't about international acclaim or money since none of that attention, at least in the early days of the sport, went to marathon runners. In fact, there was no money prize at the end of the Boston Marathon either. It was about getting the best possible time doing such a punishing and pavement pounding, but potentially very rewarding activity. It was about pushing your body to the limits. It was about testing your endurance as well as your psyche. And for many amateurs, it was about the joy of completing the course after months of training, no matter the time you got at the end of it. It's about transforming who you are. Rosie Ruiz changed her name to Rosie Vivas following a short-lived marriage in the mid-1980s. She was eventually busted for dealing cocaine to an undercover cop, did some jail time, and now lives in Florida, still claiming that she had won Boston and will run again. Her impressive stunt, likely never to be repeated because modern racing technology makes it all but impossible, was one of the defining events that drew international attention to women's marathoning in the 1980s. And indeed, the women's marathon event was finally added to the program of the 1984 Olympic Games, the first time women marathoners were ever able to compete in their sport at the highest international level. This has been Footnoting History. If you like the podcast, be sure to visit our website, footnotinghistory.com, where you can find links to further reading suggestions related to this week's episode, as well as a calendar of upcoming podcasts. You can also like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at History Footnote. Until next time, remember, the best stories are always in the footnotes. See you next week!